This is level three of the CFA program, topic on capital market expectations, and the reading on forecasting asset class returns. This reading was written by a loan author. Um, this individual has both a PhD in economics from Harvard and holds the CFA designation. I tell you that just to warn you that this, uh, this reading really gives you really good breadth and really good depth. So you get the best of both worlds, the academic world and the professional world. Now, the first couple of uh, paragraphs in this reading emphasize a couple of different things. These asset class returns that we're going to focus on are fixed income returns, equity returns, real estate returns, and currency returns. And the author mentions uh, in the very first paragraph that uh, this requires a disciplined approach. So that means that we need to put on our working gloves, get out our shovels and get ready to dig. Uh, look at some of these LOSs. You see in the bold there, fixed income returns, then the third one, equity investment market returns and then skip down to the bottom. There are real estate investment returns and forecasting exchange rates. So those are clearly the uh, most important LOSs. And then the LOSs surrounding those, you know, are kind of supportive ones. So uh, the first couple of paragraphs in the reading is a little bit of a recap. And essentially what the reading is serving as an introduction is the following. That what do we know? We've learned all about efficient markets hypothesis and Eugene Fama. We learned that the stock market is probably at least semi strong form efficient in most cases. But what the reading emphasizes is the long term nature of efficiency and the short term departure from those efficiencies, whether it's from, well, what do we have written up there? Volatilities, premiums, persistence. Uh, momentum, clustering, you know, all those behavioral issues that we did in the first couple of readings in, in level three. So the focus then is, all right, once we get away from those fundamentals, we know that over the long term, those fundamentals are going to lead us to a convergence. And that's going to help us. Well, let me go back here real quick. What's this called? Forecasting asset class returns. So the knowledge of these short term departures coupled with the knowledge that those short term de departures are going to reverse themselves gives us, you know, kind of a leg up in uh, terms of being able to forecast for the long term. And once again, this is the CFA Institute's emphasis on the policy statement is that the policy statement is designed to help the client achieve those long term risk and return objectives. Now we've learned this a couple of different ways we do this formal tools we did this level one and level two surveys we don't do too much surveying here in the cfa program we do lots and lots of judgments so high level approaches to forecasting so let's start with uh, that first asset class fixed income returns we're going to do this in one of three ways we're going to do this with the discounted cash flow model which we've learned, boy, I'm guessing that many of you even knew this before level one, you know, for fixed income returns, what, what do we get? You know, most, most bondholders invest in bonds, you know, to get the income, but there's also the capital gain component. So you have to combine the income and the capital gain to get that total return. And that total return is going to depend on the interest rate path. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Uh, risk premium approach. What we do in this case is we start with the base risk free rate of interest and then we just add a bunch of building blocks to it. The risk premium approach and then the equilibrium models. What we're going to do is we're going to say something like, OK, we have some group of bonds here and some group of bonds here and we have equities and real estate and all these other out here. So we need to kind of figure out what's going on between and among those performances. We'll probably have a conversation about correlation coefficient. So let's go ahead and start with the discounted cash flow model. So let's play the role of the bond holder. So you and I are bond holders, whether it's a issuer is a corporation or a, a government. What do we get? We get an explicit promise. The issuer promises to pay us interest. 
the issuer promises to pay us principal, right? So these are known cash flows. So lots of these bonds have fixed coupon rates. Some have uh, floating coupon rates. Um, if the cash flows are not known, like maybe in a mortgage-backed security, we can model them, you know, with a fair degree of accuracy. So when you put together a timeline from zero out to a 10-year bond or zero out to a 100-year bond like, uh, like Walt Disney issued back in the 1990s, you know, you can try to uh, estimate what those cash flows are going to be, and then we just take the present value of those. Now the question then becomes, what is the interest rate that we use to discount those cash flows in order to come up with a present value or a price? Hmm. Well, the obvious notion is to use the yield to maturity. Um, and so what do we know? The yield to maturity, that, that is actually an internal rate of return on the bond. And if we use that yield to maturity, we're assuming that um, the yield to maturity is constant over that 10 year lifetime or that 100 year lifetime, which is probably not too realistic of an assumption. So that's why back in level two, we did the spot curve, we did the par curve, we did all those different kinds of curves so that we can more accurately estimate the price of a bond today, which will then help us more accurately estimate the returns over different income, um, I'm sorry, over different interest rate paths. So this is the what we thought was probably the more a more important component of this reading. So realized returns are probably going to differ from the initial yield to maturity because yield to maturities change over time. So look at the two circle points that we have there. If the investment horizon is less than some measure of duration, let's call it the Macaulay duration here, then the uh, capital gain or loss will dominate. In other words, falling interest rates will lead to a higher realized return. On the other hand, if the investment horizon is longer than the Macaulay duration, then the reinvestment risk will dominate. Falling interest rates will then generate a lower realized return. Now, you should be scratching your heads and you should say something like, all right, Jim, you taught us at some time in level two about immunizing a bond portfolio where we're going to set the investment horizon equal to the duration of the bond and that under a certain set of circumstances like parallel shifts in the yield curve will result in uh, an offsetting of the uh, two types of risk when interest rates change and so i'll go ahead and say yes of course i taught you that before and you should remember that from before but remember that if if I'm your client and I come to you and say, hey, I want to I want to buy a lake house in six years. And so you find a 10 year bond that has a duration of six years. Well, I may come to you after three years and say, hey, I changed my mind. <laughs> I want to sell that bond today and I want to buy I want to buy the house today. So investment horizons change over time uh, and so does duration as well. All right, moving on to this, uh, this building block approach, we're gonna start with the risk-free rate of interest. And the reading goes to great lengths to, uh, to talk about uh, treasury securities. And there's a paragraph in there that says something like, well, some people think you ought to use the one-year treasury bill rate. Some people think you ought to use the 30-year treasury bond rate. And then there's a reference to a study that says it probably doesn't matter which one that you use. So just remember this. Begins with a risk-free rate of interest, which means what? Which means that when the government promises to pay you interest and principal, that there's no chance that you're not going to get that interest in principal if you hold the bond until it maturities. So then all we do is we just, you know, add, that's why we call it the building block. We just, uh, you know, it's like Legos. We just add, uh, we just add a bunch of stuff. What are some of those bunches of stuff? Term premium, credit premium, liquidity, liquidity premium. So let's go ahead and go through each of these components. Yeah, so uh, what does the short-term default-free interest rate mean? of the highest quality, right? That means that there's absolutely no risk. And it has the added component of being the most liquid. Now, I, I always scratch my head when I hear about liquidity and treasury securities because uh, 
At least in the year 2022, we have in excess of $30 trillion in the United States of treasury securities. So there are tons and tons of these bills and notes and bonds that are out there. And so uh, just from that standpoint alone, there's probably a tremendous supply. So they're probably pretty liquid. Now they're liquid for a bunch of other reasons. Uh, in addition to lots of people like these kinds of things. So there's lots of supply and there's, and there's lots of demand. Now notice that uh, final circle in there. This is what I was referring to you uh, just a moment ago about the treasury, treasury bill versus the treasury bond. So it has a maturity equal to the investment horizon. And so we're probably going to try to pick one of those treasury bills all the way out to treasury bonds, the 30 year that matches our investment horizon. Now you should ask yourself the question, Hey Jim, what does this mean about the uh, government yield curve? Right. And, uh, you know, over time we've talked about uh, yield curves and government yield curves. And, uh, you know, a lot of times government yield curves are relatively flat, which explains what I was saying earlier. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add a term premium to this. What this term premium tells us is that we need to look at that spot rate curve. So these are these are rates, these zero coupon rates for each different point along the curve. It's probably upward sloping a little bit. But what we're going to do is we're going to probably add a term premium for each uh, each maturity level. Notice what we have there in that third arrow point. They're positive. They increase with maturity are roughly proportional to the duration. That's probably at least true uh, for, at some mathematical level and, and they probably vary over time. So that that makes a lot of sense. And this is how I teach this to my students that look longer term bonds, they, you know, they have greater interest rate risk for it for a variety of reasons. And that's pretty much what the term premium uh, tells us in a general sense, but remember I said earlier, you, you know, you get the best of both worlds from, uh, from this author. So term premium is driven, first of all, by inflation, you know, so if inflation is, oh, let's pick a number, let's say 8% in the year 2022, well, then this term premium is going to be, uh, is going to be super high. Uh, recession hedge is also going to add to this term premium um, because what we know is that lots and lots of investors out there, they look, they look for these default risk-free securities to be some type of a hedge against a recession, contractions of the economy. So then when we move to riskier bonds, you know, that inflation uh, that recession hedge might not be as attractive, but it's still there. And so notice what we have in, in these two uh, embedded bullet points here. If inflation is the result of, uh, of aggregate demand, demand, then we have negative correlation. If it's caused by aggregate supply, then we have positive correlation and they result in lower or higher term premium. So I, I would remember that for the exam. That sounds like a really good question. Uh, supply and demand, this is what I was talking about earlier with the, you know, $32 trillion. And then business cycles, boy, didn't we spend a lot of time in that first uh, capital market expectations reading on business cycles. In fact, I think I had a handful of, uh, of those slides there. Of course, business cycles are going to influence. So credit premiums, then what are we worried about? We're worried about the uncertainty surrounding those coupon and principal payments which is the risk of default loss and then the expected level of those losses. So you have a probability that you're that the bond will default and then you have some kind of an expected loss level. Because remember now, if uh, well, we won't talk about the U.S. government right here, but if some government, municipal government or a corporation defaults, especially a corporation defaulting, then a judge can come in and say you, you need to sell those assets. So there'll be some recovery. Yeah, those are components of the credit spread. So the credit premium depends on credit quality. That makes perfect sense. Slope of the yield curve. And then uh, and then also volatility of the equity market is kind of a unique linkage between what we're talking about here and what we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. Uh, liquidity premium. I always tell my students this example. I say, hey, look, suppose you lend me $100. 
and I say, I'll pay you back next week. What was the interest rate that you would charge me? And students look at me and, you know, they, they say, oh, Jim, uh, we'll charge you 20%. And I say, okay, that's fine. Uh, but then what if instead of I pay you back over the short term, what if I pay you back in 50 years? What are you going to charge me in relation to 20%? And, you know, they kind of look at me funny and they say, well, t maybe 20%. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, think about it. You need to worry about the opportunity costs here. You know, you're lending, you're giving up liquidity in the short term for a week or two or a month. But if you lend it to me for 50 or 100 years, you have to give up that $100 for a super long time. <clears throat> so that liquidity premium has the component, <clears throat> excuse me, the component of an opportunity cost, but it also has the component of holding these bonds that might not have a high degree of liquidity. So here we go. What are bonds that have lots of liquidity? New bonds are always super popular. Bonds that are AAA and AA rated, they're popular with a simple structure, meaning that there's probably no embedded options, large in size, uh, bonds issued at market rates. Now, remember, you know, every every entity that borrows money tries to issue the bond in which the coupon rate and the initial yield to maturity are identical. But because of the time lag with their registration with the SEC and all of these other lagged uh, components, that a lot of times bonds are issued at rates that are different than, uh, than the coupon rate. Now, what that says, if if companies can issue a bond at a market rate, that means that they're pretty good predictors of what those rates will be in, you know, 45 or 75 days or whatever that time period is. And then bonds issued by a frequent issuer who has a reputation for uh, for issuing high quality bonds. Right. All right. So bonds with lower liquidity will have a higher liquidity uh, premium. So that makes sense there. Now, let's switch from these bonds. You know, we're talking about develop country bonds, let's go ahead and talk about emerging market bonds. And the reading has a sentence in one of its paragraphs here that it's including frontier bonds inside of these emerging market bonds, even though even though lots of uh, researchers, you know, kind of differentiate between emerging markets, which are those markets that are, you know, nearly becoming developed, but they, you know, have some op obstacles rather than the frontier markets, which are, you know, just kind of the in the infant stage. All right, so how about an emerging market bond? We need to worry about interest rate changes. We need to worry about currency movements. We need to worry, worry about potential for default. But, but we also have to worry about uh, what the reading refers to as economic risks and then political risks. So let's go ahead and and work through these. And notice down at the bottom where we have economic risks and in parentheses, ability to pay. So remember when we evaluate the risk tolerance for a client in the policy statement, we need to focus on both the ability uh, to uh, take risk and the willingness to take risk. So it's a little bit similar here uh, in, in, that, in a different kind of a context. So economic risks, they relate to the ability of the issuing country or the issuing corporation in a, in a different country. All right, so uh, let's see. We have this written down, le less likely able to settle their debts on time if they have a higher concentration of wealth, right? Just a few people, just a few, few people own, uh, own the wealth of the country. Greater dependence on cyclical industries, lots of restrictions on trade or capital flows, and poor fiscal controls and monetary discipline. Hmm. So what does that imply? Boy, insufficient fiscal and monetary control systems. Uh, that certainly means that the, the legal people in charge, they, they may or may not have a good tax policy. Uh, central banks are probably not as advanced as they are in developed countries. Well, you probably have less educated and skilled workforce, more de dependence on foreign borrowing, uh, underdeveloped and small financial markets, and volatility in their capital markets. So key considerations, fiscal deficit to GDP, debt to GDP ratio, annual growth rate, current account deficits, foreign debt, foreign exchange return. Uh, reserves and access to external support. So I want you to think about, let me go back here. Remember now we're in, you know, kind of this, uh, even though it's called 
uh, capital market expectations. It's, it's really a, a macroeconomic analysis. So these key considerations, these are, these are um, relevant and important macro variables to consider in addition to, you know, what did we say earlier, the interest rate risk, et cetera, et cetera. So remember these, uh, you know, what are those seven uh, additional components? Now let's switch over to the willingness to pay because even though an emerging uh, market may have the economic capacity or ability to pay, the individuals who are in charge, they may just say, you know what, even though we have the money, we're not gonna pay you, we're gonna just keep it. You know, So look at these things here, corruption, uh, expropriation, uh, political instability, weak property rights, capital controls, right? These make, these make sense. So some of these factors, past violations, stability, and the effectiveness of the judicial system. And so I'm going to go ahead and say this. I, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself. You know, the Institute is not asking us to become political scientists, but they are asking us to be aware of the political and legal risks. That's why, at least in big wealth management firms, you know, there's some kind of a lawyer who is involved so that... Uh, uh, we can, as good financial analysts, ask and receive counsel on, uh, on these political and legal issues. All right, switching over to equity forecasting here. So we did fixed income. Let's move to equity. <clears throat> uh, handful of these we, we know from before. So we can go through these quickly. Historical statistical approaches. You've heard me say this in multiple videos th throughout level one, level two, and now level three. In my investments class, I have students go to Yahoo Finance. We download uh, stock prices, monthly stock prices into an Excel spreadsheet. We turn them into monthly returns. And then we compute things like the average mean return per month. We then compute the standard deviation of return. <clears throat> we then compute a correlation matrix. And so what we're just assuming that history is going to repeat itself over that same time period. So this, uh, you know, this is, this is a tough one. You know, it's a good place to start, uh, but it's not a good place to end. Notice that one of those uh, bullet points there, uh, historical data can often be misleading. We know that history repeats itself, but the problem is that we don't know the timing of when history is going to repeat itself. So think about this as an approach that gives us a good starting point, but it's probably going to be uh, uh, something that we're going to want to build on. Uh, here's a here's a illustration taken right from the right from the book. So here we go. Nine, uh, not the book, the reading. 1900 to 2017. So that's over a century of returns. Notice these historical mean returns. And by the way, these are this is a 95% confidence. Um, you know, so you look over to the United States and what is that? You know, that return is, I, I don't know, 8% or something. And that 95% confidence interval is what? Five and a half to 12 and a half. 95% of the time, you know, so you get a sense 95% confidence interval, you know, all countries are not, uh, are not going to have identical historical returns. So this gives us a good context once again, to see what history tells us, and then maybe we can apply part of this to, to the future. All right, what do we start with? During our fixed income approach, we start with discounted cash flow approach. And so we might as well, we might as well do that here. <clears throat> the reading spends just a brief moment uh, talking about the Myron Gordon growth model. <clears throat> Excuse me. Notice we have constant growth model in parentheses there. We love the Myron Gordon growth model because it is uh, super easy super easy to use, super easy to understand, super easy to apply. However, its big weakness is that it assumes that the firm's growth rate is constant over an infinite time period. Now, just like the capital asset pricing model puts a lot of pressure on beta to capture systematic risk, the Gordon growth model puts a lot of pressure on that growth rate. And we know how, from level one, how to compute that, uh, that growth rate. Remember, it's a function of profitability, return on equity, and it's a function of uh, dividends. And so we call that the retention ratio. And just remember here in this part that we're rearranging the Gordon growth model to solve 
for the expected return on that individual on that individual stock. Now, what this uh, GK model does is it expands on the Myron Gordon growth model and what it does is something very similar. So look down at the bottom uh, blue box. Expected return on an individual security I is, you know, and there are those two squiggly lines on top of each other. That means approximately. So there's D over P. So that's the dividend yield. So that's the first part of the Gordon growth model. So here, here we're just saying, well, let's use the Gordon growth model. But then instead of adding just some constant growth rate over time, Let's go ahead and add some input variables that are going to impact that growth model, that, that growth rate, so that we can get a more accurate prediction. And so look in parentheses there, percentage change in earnings minus the percentage change in outstanding shares. So what this does is this allows us to look at things like profitability of the company, right? Percentage change in earnings as it relates to what are the total number of shares outstanding? So what can companies do? They can issue shares of stock. They can do this every day and they can repurchase their shares of stock. And so lots of people uh, look at this as a, a great addition to the Gordon growth model because it allows for share repurchases because what do shareholders like? They like to get dividends, although they have to pay taxes on them, but they, they like to get dividends. And then they like when companies repurchase their shares because that return on equity is going to increase. So there's that first, uh, that first difference in there that is going to add some value to that, just that little G back in the Gordon growth model. And then we're interested in what goes on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the percentage change in price earnings ratio, right? What is the market willing to pay for a dollar worth of earnings? And so this uh, Grinold Kroner model, what it does is it starts with the Gordon growth model and then it adds some extra variables. So look, you know, this is what I was saying to you earlier. Here we, we have breadth. Now, now we're getting into the depth component of this model. And so at the top there, there's the, uh, there's the definition of those variables, which is what I just gave you on that previous slide. Uh, notice the equation shows a negative relationship to share repurchases, which tells us that when the firm repurchases its shares, that expected return on equity is going to increase. Now there's another model there, the ST model. And what this does is it uses the capital asset pricing model, but it makes a couple of assumptions. It says, you know what? Let's suppose that there's something out there called the global market portfolio. And we talk about this in a couple of other readings coming up. And the global market portfolio consists of ownership in every type of security that's out there. And I always tell my students, although this isn't true mathematically and it might not even be true intuitively, but just think about owning one share of stock of every company th throughout the globe. I mean, that sounds an awful lot to me, like, you know, a general global market portfolio. So however you want to visualize that global market portfolio is probably OK. But what the ST model does is it says, you know what, let's suppose that we have a completely integrated market, which you should automatically think, all right, if we have high integration, then some measure of correlation between and among markets ought to be approaching, you know, some high correlation, maybe not one, but some high degree of correlation coefficient. So that's one part of this ST model. The other part is saying, you know what, there's a market here and there's a market here, and there might be some barriers between those two markets. And so we call those segmented markets, which means that each asset class in each market segment in each country is priced separate with their correlations uh, between and among all of those uh, all those other markets. Now, here's the equation up there at the top. Um, uh, on the left hand side of the equal sign, what we're trying to do is estimate the equity risk premium. And this is going to be a function of the degree of integration times. Now, notice what else is in this equation. There are things in there like standard deviations. There are things like uh, correlation coefficients. And then there are things like look at that ratio over there on the top. 
Uh, boy, that looks an awful lot like a sharp ratio, right? Some kind of a some kind of a return minus a risk-free return divided by some measure of risk. We'll just call it standard deviation of that uh, of that global market portfolio. You know, so here we go. The equity risk premium is a function of what's going on in the integrated markets, and then there's a plus sign. Degree of segmentation times all those same kinds of variables. Uh, on, on the right-hand side of the degree. So think about this. What, what we're doing here is we're trying to estimate an equity risk premium. And we're basing it on this concept of a global market portfolio. Some, some markets are highly or fully integrated and some are not. So this model is really just a summation of those two types of models. And it uses all the variables from the capital asset pricing model. Uh, so look down at the bottom here. Equity and bond markets of developed countries are highly integrated. We, we know that. So correlations, uh, uh, I'm sorry, degrees of integration are probably 75 to 90. In emerging markets, they're much less. Uh, and the reading says, you know, 50 to 75. So on an exam question, I would guess, I would guess if I'm doing this, this is how I would do it. That, that, uh, that the hint that we're in an emerging market would be that uh, degree of integration is maybe half, right? 50%, maybe 60%. But then for a developed country, it, it's probably 0 0.8 or 0 0.85. Notice that bottom embedded circle point. Analysts are advised to couple forecasts with other methods of analysis. <laughs> All right, how about emerging market equity risks? All right, so what are characteristics? We know this from before. Fragile economies, political and policy instability, weaker, weaker legal systems, weak disclosure. So this sounds an awful lot like the, those four circles there. They sound an awful lot like everything that we don't want in our standards when we introduce those uh, 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 standards back in level one. Prone to idiosyncratic risks. And so this is interesting that the term, remember when we first learned this, we use the term systematic and unsystematic risk. But then when we expand out to, you know, other types of unsystematic risk, we tend to use the term idiosyncratic risk which considers all this other stuff, right? So what do we need to pay attention to? Accounting and disclosure standards, corporate governance, uh, contracts and property rights laws, checks and balances on government action. So I would think that somewhere in the vignette, there would be a sentence or two that says something like, oh, the accounting standards are subpar. And that's your hint that this is probably an emerging market. Let's move on to the third asset class, real estate. And this slide reveals the difference between real estate investments and our first two asset classes. We probably know these, right? It's a physical asset, indivisible, heterogeneous and immobile, illiquid, uh, requires operating and maintenance cost, costly to sell, etc. How about historical real estate returns. So once again, we're going to have the same problems that we did with historical bond returns and historical stock returns. However, we have the added complexification that at least in the stock market, we can get daily returns. Actually, we can get hourly or we can get trade by trade data with both bid and ask prices, but not so with real estate. So as you know, uh, especially those of you who have bought and sold your own home, you probably rely on an appraisal. What these appraisals tend to do is they lower the standard deviation. So the returns are much more smooth um, and it, they probably overstate the importance of including real estate in the portfolio, uh, mostly because they understate correlations. Hmm. Now, remember back in level two, we had all those really super fun time series models. We can use those to correct for limitations in using that appraisal data. data. 
Now, as you can imagine, uh, returns in the real estate market depends on the economy, right? If the economy is expanding, what's going to happen? There are probably more people interested in buying our property, lease rates, occupancy, those are probably up. Uh, and in turn, this adds to the cycle that leads to stronger economic activity. You know, what happens first is the chicken or the egg, but either way, whichever comes first, there is... Uh, uh, there is an added value to the cycle during these economic expansions, but then, of course, the reverse is true during economic contractions, falling demand, overbuilding, and overleveraging. Boy, that's uh, that sounds like a super difficult problem to me. Um, you know, we see this, and I'm guessing you see this in your areas, uh, especially in in the United States. There seems to me like there's almost always overbuilding. <laughs> drives down property values, lease rates, and occupancy rates then fall. Now, here's probably what, at least in my opinion, what's probably the most important part of uh, the real estate section. And by the way, in the, in the reading, you know, it's a relatively long reading, but the section on real estate is uh, the by far the shortest of the four of the four asset classes. So I think it's probably important to know what these cap rates are. Uh, it's a standard measuring tool for valuing real estate investments. And so go ahead and look in the blue box there. So the capitalization rate, we call that the cap rate. It's a simple ratio. Uh, current period net operating income divided by property value. So think about this is really some kind of, boy, you know, if we were using the Gordon growth model, we would call it, we would call it the dividend yield. Now, it's not quite the same because net operating income on real property is way different than uh, than dividends. And then in the in the denominator, uh, you know, you just have stock price in the Gordon growth model. But here we have property value, which may or may not be the result of appraisal. So then what we're going to do in order to get the expected return on uh, real estate investment, we're going to take that cap rate, which, as you can see, is pretty specific to that property. And then we're going to add a growth component to it. So if you look at the bottom there, expected return, cap rate plus the uh, growth rate and net operating income, you know, it kind of looks a little bit like uh, the Myron Gordon growth model, but there's some similarities, but uh, some substantial differences there. So look at the look at the embedded bullet point right underneath the blue box in the long run. So this is what I was talking about earlier about the difference between short and long term, uh, that steady state uh, growth rate for net operating income ought to be reasonably close. You know, whatever reasonably close means to the GDP growth rate during during stable periods, right? So during that time period, what we can do is we can take the cap rate plus the uh, net operating income growth rate. And then we can subtract out that percentage change in the cap rate. And this is for this is for a relatively short term. The reading refers to it as a finite time period. You know, if you go up into that blue blue box there, that's an infinite time period, right? That's just, you know, that's just kind of like, uh, you know, some kind of present value over an infinite time period. Hmm. Notice the very bottom, cap rates are positively linked to long-term interest rates. They rise in expanding economies and fall in recessing economies. Here's just a quick illustration. Uh, what you should get from this is that, you know, uh, in terms of basis points, you know, you go from, boy, what's that look like? 100 down there in the bottom. And what's that peaked out at? Not quite, not quite 100, uh, 800 basis points. You know, so this uh, cap rate spread to the treasury yield, you know, what's that range? You know, that's a range of 700 basis points. But what you should take uh, from, away from this over this, you know, about a two decade period is that uh, those basis points have a super high correlation, whether it's the apartment, office, retail, industrial or the hotel. And how about we end with a conversation on risk premiums? And so in order to think about this in terms of a risk premium, we need to consider the simple fact that real estate <clears throat> has characteristics that look like a bond. So there's probably a term premium in there. There's probably a credit premium in there. And real estate has characteristics that are probably similar to equities. And so they probably have some relationship to the business cycle, like we just mentioned here in, 
in that previous slide. So think about there should be a bond risk premium and an equity risk premium in there, keeping in mind that real estate is probably not too liquid, at least direct investments. And so investors require that compensation for liquidity. And the reading gives a suggestion for real estate liquidity premiums of between two and 4%. Now, what we can do is once we do all this stuff, here, let me go back here real quick. Once we, once we consider the real estate as a hybrid asset and we figure out bond premiums and equity premiums, then we're probably going to have to make some more adjustments. We can eliminate the impact of smoothing by using, you know, some kind of a model out there, maybe a time series model or some other model. We can add a liquidity premium to it. A liquidity risk premium and we can also use that ST model that we talked about oh, 15 or 20 minutes or so. How about a comparison between public and private real estate? You know I would think that only large institutional investors and probably high net worth individual investors can include direct real estate investments. I always, uh, I always mention to my students whenever I have an exam question you know I'll, I'll do a vignette for them and I'll have uh, I'll have an individual own a series of miniature golf courses because I loved miniature golf courses when I was uh, when I was younger. Uh, direct property investment is costly. Yeah, diversification is not quite easily as achieved for small investors. And then, of course, what we can do is we can go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and we can buy a REIT. So these REITs, you know, they behave like uh, like equities in the short term, short term, and probably like uh, real estate in the long run. Hmm. So it's difficult to compare those characteristics because of smoothing and differences in properties and different types of leverage. And there are some statistics down at the bottom on long term housing returns. Let's move on to forecasting exchange rates, because after all, what we've just done is try to forecast fixed income returns, equity returns and real estate returns in the context of a global economy. So those actual returns, right, those realized returns to those three asset classes are only one component of the total return because the exchange rate may change in our favor or against us when we make these kinds of investments. So we need to worry about not only today's exchange rates, but what the exchange rates are going to be when those bonds mature, when we want to sell the real estate and when we want to sell our equity position. So the basic question about exchange rates is that uh, you have two economies, one economy here, and one economy here. And if the two economies are exactly the same size and have the exact same kind of production, when they trade with each other, there's probably going to be a, a unitary exchange rate, right? A one for one. And then, of course, we have other things that are going to influence what that level of exchange rate is and its movements over time. So that's what the first part of this LOS addresses, these uh, factors that will determine exchange rates. So we said trading, right? So, but also we have to worry about the government. We have regulations, we have customs, we have different financial systems, we have different central banks, different attitudes about inflation and interest rates and unemployment. So that's a pretty general idea about those factors that determine the interest, uh, the exchange rates. So let's go into a little bit more detail here. We can do trade flows. This is the effect of trade flows on exchange rates. It's probably relatively small, mostly because when we send goods or services that way, that those uh, organizations or businesses up there in a different country, well, they're probably going to finance that in some way. You know, maybe it's just five days of terms of trade, but some way there's going to be financing. So if you consider, you know, the flow of the flow of goods and services and then the flow of capital, that's probably relatively small. Now, when there's large when there are large trade uh, trade flows, it's probably a signal of a crisis. Uh, what do we know about purchasing power parity? I first heard of this when I was an undergraduate student in uh, in a macroeconomics class when my professor said something like, you know, if you buy a if you buy a Big Mac here in uh, in Pennsylvania, where I went to college, uh, uh, 
how much will you pay? Who knows what it was uh, back in 1980. But then if you go to Canada and buy that same Big Mac, you ought to be able to pay, you ought to be able to change your dollars into Canadian dollars and it ought to cost the uh, same amount. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what purchasing power parity tells us. But what's interesting, uh, the added element in this purchasing power parity is the difference between inflation, expected inflation levels. You know, for some reason that uh, the price of a bun in Canada was expected to, let's say, double or triple, well, then I probably couldn't trade my U.S. dollars in for Canadian dollars and buy that same, uh, buy that same Big Mac. Uh, what do we know about governments and how they keep track uh, debits and credits? So the current account, yeah, when uh, uh, the sensitivity to exchange rate movements in the current account will probably increase if there are restrictions that are imposed on the capital flows. And this is the example that I was, I was telling you initially here. So pay attention to the source of the imbalance, right? Persistence and sustained current account balances will probably have the biggest influence on the uh, on the change in the exchange rate. Of course, adjusting capital flows, that's going to exert great pressure on exchange rates, but it depends on things like capital mobility. I mean, what was I saying earlier? You know, you could just take your, your money for your Big Mac and exchange it very, very quickly and buy a Big Mac up in, uh, up in Canada. What that means then is that there's a free flow of capital just for goods and services, but also for, uh, also for investments. Remember now, capital mobility is going to seek the highest risk adjusted return, whether it's inside of the country or outside of the country. Uh, this is probably a super important equation here, but it's uh, built on what we've done in the past. So what did I say in this back right here? Uncovered interest rate parity, countries that offer better risk adjusted returns should see, uh, should see capital inflows, uh, great pressure on exchange rates. So let's kind of summarize all of that. So look on the left hand side of the equal sign, the expected rate of change in a foreign currency denominated in local currency terms, right? There's the D for the domestic and the F for the foreign. So what does this expected rate of change depend on? And it depends on differentials. So all of those uh, in the building blocks that we did for, uh, for bonds, that, that applies here. Uh, the equity risk premium applies here as well. Maybe not so much a, uh, any of those uh, real estate premiums that we talked about. But remember, when we did the real estate, that was a combination of the debt uh, and the equity. So let's go ahead and go through these just quickly here. So uh, the difference between the nominal interest rate between the two countries the difference in the term premium, the difference in the credit premium, the difference in the equity premium, and the difference in the liquidity premium. So notice, <clears throat> notice that there's a plus sign, you know, between each of those uh, sets of parentheses. So we're going to we're going to be tempted to add all of those. But the foreign market could have higher term premiums, higher credit premiums, right? Higher liquidity premiums in there. So that equation is going to lead us to conclude that our expected rate of change of the currency is going to either appreciate uh, or depreciate. Now, remember, we talk about this. I, I said this earlier in the slide, but we did it back in our behavioral finance conversations and we did it uh, back in level two as well, is that you got to concern yourself with the difference between short term and long term over the long term over the long term, you know, exchange rates are going to move to their kind of fundamental level. And that's what I was kind of hinting at earlier when I said, you know, think of the economy here and think of another economy here, two countries. If these have, you know, pretty much identical productions, you know, then it's going to be a unitary rate in the long term. But in the short term, you can have all sorts of things that go on. You can have fundamental changes. You can have technical changes. You can have behavioral changes. You can have government influence changes. You can have custom changes. You can have all different sorts of kinds of changes. So in the short term, we have to worry about this thing called overshooting. So in the short term, let's suppose that the exchange rate just appreciates, right? So then what happens? after that short term 
period is nearing an end, well, bondholders especially, but investors in general are probably going to say, you know what, this currency, this rate has appreciated, appreciated far too much. We're going to have this, you know, uh, uh, reversion to the mean. And so we're going to anticipate a reversal. And then over the long term, that exchange rate is going to depreciate to its more fundamental level. So clearly this provides us with a super challenge as wealth managers because in the long term we can probably we can probably be fairly accurate estimators of those exchange rates. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we're going to have clients who want to exchange their foreign investments, you know, next week or next month or next year, and so this is going to be a super challenge for us. Yeah, the top of the slide just kind of summarizes what I was uh, what I was saying here. Oh, and you can go through the whole carry trades. We did this back in uh, in level one and level two, where we're going to borrow in some uh, currency, probably probably try to pay a low interest rate, and then convert to another currency, searching for a higher rate of return. And what that means is that uh, if in fact we can earn statistically significant uh, returns, this is probably a violation of some kind of interest rate parity, probably uncovered interest rate parity. Uh, how about this concept of hot money when we're trying to capture the difference between two interest rates? You know, what this does uh, increases the challenges to estimate exchange rates because central bank is probably going to have less ability to manage that monetary policy as you know kind of a buffer or you know maybe a mountain that's preventing those flows from occurring uh, it, what this also does is it encourages companies to borrow in the short term and borrow more in the short term and maybe even to finance long-term projects Yeah, the reading then goes into a couple of paragraphs on how central banks can help solve this problem. I don't want you to get the idea that central banks are perfect and that they can solve all of these problems. Uh, but central banks, what they can do uh, is that they can they can lead us. They can lead the markets into, a, you know, kind of a self solution if governments buy and sell their own bonds. And of course, you probably in that number one up at the top, you probably have to concern yourself with not just government bonds, but you know, what has our U.S. central bank been doing buying uh, uh, mortgage backed securities and other kinds of securities? Although that's probably not included in the reading, so you don't have to worry about that for the LOS. Uh, controlling interest rate targets and then directly going in the market, buying and selling uh, that foreign currency. So what about portfolio balance and composition? So remember this concept of the global market portfolio. What did I tell you just, you know, 30, 40 minutes ago? Think of it as owning one share of stock of every company that's out there. I mean, that's not probably mathematically correct, but it's, it's probably OK to think of it like that. So if a country has lots and lots of economic growth, what that means is the economy is expanded, expanding. And then those companies inside of that expanding economy probably have price appreciation. So that means that that share, that allocation of an increasing economy is probably going to re be reflective in a larger portion of the global market portfolio. Hmm. So then what's going to happen is that investors are probably going to search for those higher returns, move to that country and that currency, and that's going to have an accompanying uh, weakening effect on the currency and probably increase risk premiums. <clears throat> How do you mitigate these above impacts or these effects? Uh, this is called a home currency bias. What does this mean? That people in the United States tend to own companies that trade, uh, uh, companies that are headquarters inside of the United States. That makes sense. Well, here's the next step. You know, what, it's one thing to be able to uh, to estimate an exchange rate for a six month period or a one year period or a five year period. But then how do we get to that point? You know, do we get there like this with lots of volatility or is it a straight line? Of course, it's not going to be a straight line. So what do we need to do here and try and in terms of forecasting volatility? So we're going to use what's known in the academic world as a variance covariance matrix. And so all we're going to do on the diagonal terms in this matrix, you know, it's going to be a big box is going to be the 
variances and then uh, each opposite side of the boxes are going to be all of the covariances. And so the easiest way to do this is using historical return data. And we talked a little bit ago about the problems with using historical data, but remember I told you that I have my students uh, put together uh, a calculation on correlation coefficient when we download these stock prices. Well, you can do the same thing with exchange rates, and then you can form a variance covariance matrix based on based on historical data. And so here's just a simple example. Notice that, uh, notice that uh, down the, uh, the, the diagonal, there's just a one. And then on the opposite sides, those are the covariances. So just, uh, just so you know, covariance between stock A and stock B, see it's 1.073. And then the covariance between stock A and stock B is 1.073. So you should get this point there. Now, what we try to do then is, if you think about it, how many how, how many exchange rates are out there, how many stocks are out there, how many fixed income securities are out there. So it makes sense then to put together some kind of a sample variance covariance matrix that is an unbiased estimator of what that actual variance covariance might mean. You know, what is, what is it? It's simple, we like that, but it's probably gonna have sampling errors. And boy, if you got these large number of asset classes, that was, that's what I was saying about, you know, the number of stocks out there, boy, it's, uh, it's a huge amount. Another problem is that there's probably terrible consistency cross-sectionally. So in order to solve these problems, what we do is we say something like, hey, didn't we use a factor model I think in a recent recording, we did the, uh, the Fama French factor model. Well, we could come up with, with multiple factor models. It doesn't really matter what those factors are. It doesn't really matter who invented that model. But what we're trying to do is ex the exact same thing that Fama and French did while looking at uh, equity returns. Well, what are some... What are some factors here? Well, you could think of things like, well, let's go back. I'm not going to go back to that slide. That's 10 slides ago. You know, we had inflation. <clears throat> you know, we had liquidity. We had interest rate differentials. We had GDP. We could do all those kinds of things as factors. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use those factors to reduce the number of observations rather than having to go and look at all of the stocks, all the bonds, all the exchange rates. Uh, what this will do then is this will uh, remove that inconsistency cross-sectionally that I talked about just a few moments ago. So there it is in the blue box there. Uh, all we're trying to do is estimate the return on some particular assets. So this is, you know, hopefully a linear relationship. That's why we have an intercept term there. And then what are we doing? We're adding, there's a beta. Now remember when Stephen Ross taught us the arbitrage pricing model. Uh, he called that uh, he called that a sensitivity factor. So that's what beta is there. And then F is a factor. And that factor could be, you know, almost anything. It could be inflation. That makes sense. It could be uh, uh, GDP. That makes sense. And then there's a, a disturbance term on the end. And so think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to identify the relevant factors that explain the return on a particular asset. Well, then we're going to take it a step further and we're going to say, well, let's go ahead and all right, let me go back here. This gives us the return. And in this box, this gives us the variance of that particular asset. And this formula <clears throat> should be familiar to you back from level two. All we're going to do is have the double sum and we've got two betas uh, and we have a covariance. Now, notice in the uh, in the gray box we've red bolded the p and the q so this is important for you to remember that row is the covariance between the each individual factor one's a p and and one is a q so the covariance between and let's say inflation and gdp growth and then that v at the end is the variance of that unique term or the what did i call it earlier the disturbance term what we can do then is we can use something similar and we can compute the covariance between the I asset and the J asset, which is very similar to what we've done above. Now, this is probably more important than the mathematics of those equations because the reading doesn't do anything with those, uh, with those 
uh, equations other than ask you to discuss and explain. So what are these assumptions? Factors are not redundant, right? So we don't want to have we don't want to have two very very similar factors. We want to have them to be independent. Factors do not have zero terms. That makes perfect sense there. Uh, ensures a meaningful matrix outcome and avoids identifying a riskless portfolio, you know, by mistake or hopefully not by random. So what happens when we use this, uh, this sample, so to speak, this sample variance covariance matrix using this uh, shrinked, you know, that's what the reading calls it, uh, the shrinked uh, input variables, what we're going to do is we're going to say something like, you know what, instead of us just having all this data, let's come up with a target variance covariance matrix. What do we think? What do we think? What do we expect the variances and the covariances to be between and among all of these different factors? And that's what we do when we come up with this constant variance matrix. And so it increases the data precision, it reduces estimation errors, and there's the, uh, the disadvantages that, boy, there might be a shrinkage bias in there because of sampling problems that we've talked about in many, many different uh, readings over level one and level two. All right, how about estimating volatility from smooth returns? So uh, it, it involves infrequently recorded returns you know we've talked about this with appraisals it has a downward bias for volatility it distorts those correlations it overstates returns and overstates the benefits of diversification so how do we handle this problem what we do is we go back to level two and remember we did those auto regressive conditional heteroscedasticity models that's going to be used to uh, address this clustering of volatility Clustering, of course, means that you know there are there are clusters over time. Remember, we do these time series series models. So we have we have clustering here that might be low. We have clustering up here that might be high. And then there's you know something in between. But you have to make a huge jump in between those low and high volatility periods, which pretty much messes up your variance covariance matrix. How about this last LOS where we're getting back to this uh, global investment portfolio and in a macroeconomic sense. So what did I say to you in the very beginning? Uh, the author of this article asks us to have a disciplined approach. So here's kind of a summary of what that disciplined approach might look like. Huh. High level aspects or the broadest view. So that's why I did this here with the, you know, the breadth. Look at what is driving global economic growth. Once again, you know, top-down approach. What we're saying is, all right, we have all these economies throughout the world. What is happening out there? Is it technology? Is it social media? Is it energy? Is it healthcare? What is driving gro global economic growth? So then, you know, top-down, we get to each individual country. All right, which country is better suited to capture those trends in economic growth. And then inside of those countries, which stage of the business cycle is prevalent in those countries so that we can decide that we want to invest right on the upslope. We want to invest in an economy in which the economy is growing, of course, and then our individual company is growing to capture that uh, global portfolio. I'm sorry, that global uh, growth. Yeah, these questions can help analysts make adjustments too. Yeah, making the choice between equity and fixed income securities, specific country investments, oh, credit ratings, currency exposures, positioning on the yield curve. So do you see, you know, this is the broad stroking here so that we're going to try to find out what are the best assets, financial assets for our client. All right, a couple of final things here. Trend growth, uh, global integration, uh, phases of the business cycle, monetary and fiscal policies, current accounts and capital accounts. And that's going to take us to this kind of a summation here. So let me go back and just go through these you know, relatively quickly. So what are we hoping for? Higher trend growths in a country will probably increase our portfolio weightings in that particular country, but 
most, more specifically in equity securities and real estate securities, because, you know, after all, when you own a fixed income security, you're guaranteed, you're not guaranteed, excuse me for saying that, you're promised, you're promised and uh, explicitly to be paid interest in principal. And as a bondholder, you don't get to share in the profitability of the company. But so high growth trend rates will lead you to invest more in equity and real estate for the similar reasons. Uh, outstanding bonds would be under downward pressure. Yes, as more yeah, that, as more fixed income and more competitive rates are issued. Okay, so that correlates with what I was saying uh, above. Higher trend, higher real interest rates, decreasing bond values. Now we can go back to that ST model that we talked about earlier. And once, once the economies become more globally integrated, those premiums in emerging or frontier economies are probably going to decline. So required returns should decline. How about the business cycle here? How oh, this makes sense, didn't we? We spent a whole bunch of time here in the previous reading talking about, you know, the trough all the way to the peak and then all the way back down. And so look at the blue and the red uh, and the red boxes. These are probably good exam questions at, at the trough of the business cycle. Right before we start expanding, we want to increase allocation to equity, decrease our allocation to fixed income. So and this is what I was saying just a moment ago. We want to capture that growth as a shareholder so that we can we can keep that profitability to ourselves. When the economy is at the peak, right, then we want to decrease our, our allocation to equities and then move those, the, shift those over to fixed income securities uh, to capture the capital gains in the fixed income market. Because as we go down there, as we go down that downward slope, interest rates are probably going to fall and that'll increase uh, fixed income prices. Now, the problems, of course, are that you know, we don't know what that length, we don't know what that intensity of the business cycle is going to be from country to country. So what does that second diamond point say? Always perform the necessary due diligence. This is what I was saying earlier in this slide deck about uh, putting on our gloves and getting out our shovels. Yeah, I love it when a reading refers to the efficient markets hypothesis. I alluded to this in the very beginning here. Uh, monetary and fiscal policy decisions may already be included in asset prices. Boy, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to pound my head on that one. Uh, you know, of course, Eugene Fama tells us in 1970 that this is public information, so it ought to be reflected. However, what we know is that uh, those central bankers and uh, and the government uh, agents, they change their mind all the time. And so we're not quite sure exactly exactly how efficient monetary and fiscal policy decisions are already included in asset prices. All right, the current account balance and the capital accounts. Remember what we've got, uh, you know, we've got ex exports and imports on one hand. And then on the other hand, we have cash flows coming in or going out. And so these two will uh, the, the balance in these two accounts will help us to determine uh, what is the main driver of those changes in exchange rates. All right, so how about quantifying these views? Here's our last, uh, here's our last slide. So what are we going to try to do? Estimate that variance covariance matrix and then maybe adjust it with a model, maybe the ST model, maybe the GK model. And then uh, probably add some building blocks in there, ask a whole bunch of questions, you know, where do, where do our fellow analysts think things are moving? What is the impact of, you know, let me just pick an example, uh, the energy crisis, you know, are we moving, are we going to continue to move away from fossil fuels? Are we gonna continue to build turbines uh, and solar energy plants? Boy, this is super critical, important. So, you know, directional views on currencies relative to that, uh, to that asset base. And then we're gonna add a currency component for uh, equities and, uh, and uh, fixed income securities. And then we can go back to that Black Litterman framework. Remember that? So we do all this work and then we say something like, let's go ahead and ask ourselves the question, what? What does the client think? And when I say the client, I don't mean someone like me, right? An individual investor. But what does, you know, let's, let's 
let's use the example of a, like a big endowment fund for a university. You know, what do, what do the really smart men and women on the investment committee of that, uh, of that college endowment fund? And remember, some of those individuals, they might, they might work for the college, they might be uh, independent contractors for the college, and they might be wealth managers. I mean, all different sorts of people will do that. And let's figure all that stuff out, and then let's go back and repeat and repeat. And so I hope you got the sense during this, you know, fairly long slide deck that this is a macroeconomic analysis for those four, those four classes. So I would focus on fixed income, equity, real estate, and currency as it complements those first three asset classes and be able to answer a question that says something like, hey, you know, here's a bunch of stuff whether it's for a bond, a share stock, or a piece of real estate. And then somewhere in there, there'll be some currency estimates in there. You know, what's a reasonable expectation for uh, a return in that particular asset class? So thank you for studying along with me in, the, in this slide deck. Thank you for watching and uh, good luck the rest of the way.